Yeah, good evening. My name is uh, Tandika Mkandawiri. I'm a professor of African development here at the LSE. Uh, I'd like to welcome, <coughs> welcome you all to the third Steve Biko Memorial Lecture in Europe at the LSE. And this is a joint event between the LSE and the Steve Biko Foundation. I would also like to extend a particularly warm welcome to friends and associates of the foundation uh, with us today. Today's event will be recorded and, and we'll be on video, and uh, also there's a, there'll, be iP no, you, there'll be a podcast if you're interested in that. And may I ask all of you to, including me, to switch off your <laughs> mobile phones. I mean, I, I forgot about that. Um, and for those who are into new technologies, the LSE Twitter hashtag is hashtag LSE Beko. I'm delighted to have you here, Mr. Keller, here, and I will say something about him later on. But first, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Amposa, the Director of uh, International Partnerships of the Stig Bigo Foundation, who will say something. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How is everyone tonight? Oh, please, people, you can do much better than that. How is everyone tonight? Better. I mean, Hugh Masakela is here. Don't embarrass me. Um, as the professor said, my name is Odenoa Amponsa. I am the director of the Steve Biko Foundation, and I'm really delighted to be here with you again this evening for the third Steve Biko Memorial Lecture, Europe. Um, and it's really lovely to see so many new faces in such a full room, but also to see so many old friends. I'd particularly like to acknowledge our friends from the Steve Biko Housing Association, who we do so much work with year after year, and of course, the Chief Executive Officer um, and Founder of the Steve Biko Foundation, my boss, Mr. Nkosanati Biko, if you could please stand so that people could see <laughs> I'd also like to acknowledge what are new partners for us in this particular initiative, the British Council, represented here by Mr. Graham Sheffield, as well as Mr. Tom Porter, who's here all the way from Johannesburg, South Africa. So we were going to get the prize for traveling the farthest, but then he went and ruined it. But welcome, Tom, and thank you for your support. My task this evening is really a simple one, and that's just to give you a little bit of background in terms of why we've asked you to be here yet again for the third time, and really who we are as an institution, the Steve Biko Foundation. This lecture is in many ways a continuation of the Steve Biko Memorial Lecture that takes place uh, in Cape Town each year. We just had our 15th annual Biko Memorial Lecture. Um, and one of the things that we noticed over the years was that year on year, while we would get tons of response from within South Africa, after all, people like Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, and a host of other people such as Ben Oprey have delivered that lecture. What we noticed was that really we were getting a lot of response from, of course, the continent, which made a lot of sense, our neighbors, but more so in Europe. And we realized that that was really a result of two things. One, I think the historic ties that bind people in Europe with people in South Africa, things like the anti-apartheid movement, which was very vocal here, as well as other anti-colonial movements, such as the Pan-African movement. We know that many of the people that ended up leading that were actually students here um, in London and in other areas of the UK. But one of the other things that we also came to realize over the years was that the changing demographics in Europe, more and more people of African descent coming and living in communities, not only in, in England, but, but throughout the continent, meant that people were increasingly asking questions about who they are, who they were in relation to other people, and looking for spaces to, to interrogate that. And I think I was actually reminded of that yesterday. I was speaking at the BME National Housing um, Conference. And after my talk, an elderly gentleman comes, I shouldn't say elderly, my mother would be very upset. An older gentleman comes up to me and he says, what's your mother's maiden name? And I told him, it's Ashy for the record, it's a terrible maiden name. I said, I'm, I'm a member of the Ashy family. And he said, oh, you're so-and-so's daughter, aren't you? And proceeded to list all of my aunts and uncles, the band that my uncle used to play in, my grandmother's favorite color. So clearly this guy was the real deal. He knew my family, he knew who I was, and I encountered him all these many miles away from home simply because I look a lot like my mother. And of course, that got me thinking of the, the sort of personal ties that bind, but how do we translate those personal ties, these growing communities, into real tools for social, economic, and cultural change and development, really helping us to, to deal with some of the most pressing problems of the 21st century. 
And that's fundamentally what we seek to do at the Steve Vigo Foundation, and that's really the purpose for this lecture, creating a space for African thought leaders to critically interrogate who we are and who we want to be in this context in relation to the wider world. Now, in terms of our work at the foundation, we tend to focus on what we call the three C's. The first is consciousness, the second capacity, and the third community. Consciousness being a critical understanding of ourselves, our communities, and how we advance the societies people like Steve Biko spoke of when he said things like knowledge of self is paramount to the emancipatory program. Similarly, capacity being the confidence in ourselves as well as the tangible skills to advance social and economic development. And thirdly, community, the one that I actually think is most important, which is an understanding that our successes and failures are not about us individually, but that we're inherently linked to one another through our common humanity. And in South Africa, this is a term that we would call Ubuntu. Practically as an institution, we carry out this work in the areas of leadership development, dialogue, as well as research policy and publications with a particular focus on arts and culture, community health, economic justice, education, social history, as well as sports. And so I think I'll end there, but really just to say thank you to our father, Hugh Masakela, for being with us this evening. Um, some of you may or may not know that he's been on tour for the past six weeks. He left Canterbury early this morning to be with us and flies off to the Czech Republic tomorrow. But his office said no. He was very committed to coming and sharing his experiences with us here. For those of you who will not be able to get enough tonight and having had conversations with him this afternoon, I know you'll, you'll leave wanting to hear more. He will be in concert uh, on Monday evening back here in London, and so you can take that opportunity to uh, see him exercise his gift. In closing, I would like to say thank you all for being here with us. Thank you to our partners here at the London School of Economics, as well as the British Council, and of, and of course, Mr. Hugh Masakela for being with us and, in the words of Steve Biko, reminding us that we have set on a quest for a true humanity and that somewhere on the distant horizon we can see the glittering prize. Let us march forth with courage and determination, drawing strength from our common plight and brotherhood. In time, we shall be in the position to bestow upon South Africa, and I would say the world, the greatest gift possible, a more human face. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to LSE the legend, Hugh Masekela. <laughs> <laughs> Where today's lecture is on the role of art and specific, more specifically music in the liberation struggle. I wouldn't be, I would be very surprised if there's any liberation struggle anywhere in the world in which art and music have played such a profound role as in South African case. And Hugh has been central to this fusion of, of, of art and liberating struggle. And if over the years you've listened carefully to Hugh, you'll have learned about a whole range of experiences of people of South Africa. You will have learned about the past system and the day-to-day -day humiliation of millions of people. You will have probably have learned but endless police raids and the children screaming to calling for their mothers to hide the way as police come in. You will also have heard of the thousands of people who languished in prison, and you'll have heard of the calls for their release. And as some of you may remember Hughes anthem on the release of Mandela. You'll also have heard of calls to arms and the encouragement to the young and the brave. South Africans who took up to arms, warning their foot, basoko their foot, as the arms struggle became more intense. You definitely will have heard about the system of labor in Southern Africa through his very famous and evocative song, Stimela, which sang about the millions of people from the, from the Southern African <coughs> continent that were dragged into a system of extremely exploited the labor force, and who worked and died in what she says in the deep, deep, deep down in the underbelly of the mines. Those trends took back, the same trends, took back millions of people back to their homes, some of them diseased, in many cases uh, wounded, 
and, and with them they carried their guitars, their gramophones, their records, their accordions, and of course, South African music. I'm a product of the line of rail. Brought up in a town on this line of rail in Zimbabwe. I'm born in, in, in line of rail in Zimbabwe and brought up in Copper Belt, where again on, along the same line of rail. I have therefore been privileged to have listened to you since I was about 13, 14 years old. He was about a year older than I was, so I kept track of you, Fuse music for all these years. Partly because the first urban sounds of the Copper Belt were largely South African music. This was the first uh, large gathering of, of Africans in, uh, in uh, outside South Africa, <coughs> largest labor force, and they listened to South African music, and we all listened to South African music. In the 60s, we thought that, and this I think you could sense in the music of, of South Africa, that as Lutuli said, freedom was around the corner. As it turned out, this was not to be the case. Um, the apartheid system unleashed huge, unleashed an, an, you know, unprecedented violence that led to the Sharpeville massacre. And many of our South Africa's best artists were forced out in exile, and so was you. And he, of course, he spent 30 years outside South Africa. Hughes' music did not confine itself to South Africa. He also you know, sang a lot about Africa. He sang about the corruption in Africa. He had sung about presidents who refused to go. And in you know, one of the most evocative songs about people have, that have to leave, he asked him, say, why don't you set him to want to leave? And he also sang about the joys South African people, their music, their laughter, their sense of humor, even under the most difficult conditions. I first heard Hugh live at the Village Gate in New York, where he played, most, most of the songs he played were from the Americanization of, uh, of Oga Boga, which was a, which, a record which had the cover of Hugh uh, dressed up in a business suit and briefcase and barefoot in the jungle which was really a take on Tarzan and, uh, and, the African, and, and the African culture. I had the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Just kidding, the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> and I, mean, I, first, I first met uh, Hugh in Harare, where he wanted to set up a music studio, but it, it never worked out. So in many ways, this man has had a profound impact in many, a whole generation of us who, who, was, who followed the struggle for, for, for struggle. And so in many ways, he has been an inspiration and a reliable and sure-footed guide to many of us over the years. And on behalf of the LSE and on my own behalf, welcome uh, you and Sekela to LSE. And I hope and I would invite you to share with us your reflections on music and the liberation struggle. Thank you. supposed to do or say today. <laughs> I hope that when we leave here you'll have some bail money for me. <laughs> Surprise. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'd just like to clarify a few points that uh, um, um, Tandika forgot to mention, that in the picture that he was talking about on the cover of the album, uh, the Americanization of Uga Booga, I also was carrying, besides a briefcase, a Wall Street Journal. <laughs> but most of all, I'm not 
and a legend, neither am I an icon. Uh, if I came from Japan, I probably would be a wonderful sushi chef. <laughs> if I came from Germany, I probably would be a hell of a beer brewer. But I came from a place of music, and um, for me, it was like a pig in dirty mud because I was bewitched with music from infancy. <clears throat> So I just w want to clarify that if it wasn't for the people I come from, I wouldn't be anything at all. There's a train that comes from Namibia and Malawi. There's a train that comes from Zambia and Zimbabwe. There's a train that comes from Angola and Mozambique, from Lesotho, from Botswana, from Swaziland, from all the hinterlands of southern and central Africa, this train carries young and old African men who are conscripted to come and work on contract in the gold and mineral mines of Johannesburg and the surrounding provinces and metropoli. 16 hours or more a day for almost no pay. Deep, 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 deep down in the belly of the earth when they are digging and drilling for that mighty evasive stone or when they dish that mishmash mush food into their iron plates with the iron shovel or when they sit in their stinky, filthy, funky, flea-ridden barracks and hostels and they think about the loved ones they may never see again because they might already have been forcibly removed from where they last left them or perhaps wantonly murdered in the dead of night by roving or marauding gangs of no particular origin. So we are told. They think about their lands and their herds that were taken away from them with the gun and the cannon, with the collaborator and the dog and the tear gas and the poison, with the bomb and the gatling. And when they hear that choo-choo train, a puffing and a smoking and a toting and a steaming and a crying and a wailing and a moaning and a screeching and yeah, yeah. They curse and they curse the coal train, the coal train that brought them to Johannesburg, Stimela.
Hambanga malate. Sivele tala kupai. Sangi la sagua kuta. Eva be. But this is Zumba malate. Zumba malate. Stimela si hambanga malase si vele tala kupa yo yo yi palele sangi lasangwa kuta homba be but this is all homba malase. Ati iyo ho 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 silinu le kompone ha ngapya paisa lapo we stimela wo tu tiwa we na silinu le kompone ha ngapya paisa Chigalapo, si canelli si sova se tu ololoma, basi buele ne talaku, canelli si gane se tu man, basi buele ne tala, si canella bo baby we tu nyono ne ne ne, basi buele ne talaku, canella masali we tu. But the mall of an amol 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 of an Stimela, si hamba hanga malaki, si vele. Helele mar, stimela, 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 yeah, stimela, mamo. Si hamba hanga malaki, si vele, helele mar, stimela. Si hamba nga malase, si vele tala kupai. Si mela, si hamba nga malase, si vele tala kupai. Simela, si hamba gamalati, si vele tala kupai.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's amazing. It always amazes me on stage that such a sad song can always be received with so much joy and happiness. <laughs> but then, I guess that's what life is about, is joy, happiness, and a whole lot of sadness. When I was invited here to this lecture, um, I trembled and I nearly wet my pants. <laughs> and uh, my personal assistant said to me, Nkosinati, Biko insists that you do this. He's asking you, but he's insisting that you do it. So I said, you know, I've never done anything like this before. And to follow all these great intellectuals who have spoken here, but uh, because uh, of Bantu, Stephen Biko, I will definitely do it. I was given leeway to really speak about what I felt. Uh, I know I was supposed to speak about liberation and music, but um, so much has been said on that subject, and to a great extent, um, the music doesn't seem to have really worked, because even though Bob Marley and Harry Belafonte and the Beatles and Bob Dylan and Miriam McEva and all, you know, all these people have tried to sing about um, bringing about peace. Um, <clears throat> Ever since I was born in 1939, people have been at war, and it hasn't stopped yet. But one day, probably it will. There's a screw somewhere. Shit! That we're supposed to turn, but it's very difficult to find. So, here we go. Ever since the years of the African slave trade, Western and Northern society That's the most perfect timing I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, God? Okay. I'll start again. <laughs> Maybe I should drink water because I always see speech makers drinking water. I come here in the spirit of Bantu Biko. Ever since the years of the African slave trade, Western and Northern society have zealously regarded it nonsensical for the indigenous peoples of our continent to contemplate any thoughts about human rights, emancipation, protest, revolution, liberation, reparations, distribution of skills, or any other mindset related to deliverance from bondage. The virus of this form of bigotry has since found its way into the bloodstreams of several other non-European communities, some of which have subsequently come to perceive Africans as the lowliest of species. During the 1940s, when I began to discover the miracles of speech and writing, hearing and understanding, I came to view the philosophy of racial prejudice as being a singularly South African phenomenon. It was, it was against the law, for instance, for Africans to drink alcohol during those years. In the native settlement of Kwakuta, a hundred miles east of Johannesburg, my grandmother's house where I was born, also operated as a Shabin, a township illegal drinking establishment, which afforded her a relatively com comfortable life in comparison to many other ordinary household in a community. 
she was independence personified. My grandmother, Johanna Mabena Bowers, raised my sister Barbara and I under very strict laws, very strict rules, and rigid discipline. However, she made certain that we were always impeccably well-dressed and finely groomed. She always insisted on excellence, on us growing up to aim at being extraordinary, even as infants. In this rural small coal mining town of Whitbank, Joanna would take us to the Saturday summer morning markets where Indian traders and Afrikaner Dutch farmers sold fruits and vegetables, live free-range chickens, household goods, spices, fabric, and other kinds of livestock. As we paced up and down the narrow, crowded sidewalk behind Grandma, poor raggedy Afrikaner children, red-faced with cracked bare feet, would insolently to taunt us from the small flatbed lorries of their absent parents, jumping around like chimpanzees, calling us baboons. My sister and I were hardly six years old at the time. Johanna would whisper to us, don't pay them any mind, those badly raised and rotten ragamuffins. You are far better than them. They don't even deserve for you to look them in their eyes, those eyes that are so bloodshot. Just walk proudly next to me with your hairs held up high, and don't you dare drop those chickens you are carrying. <laughs> walk, walk, walk faster. Come on. Her words remained forever emblazoned on the walls of my every thought. They would become my life's mantra. Ever since then, I have never once dropped a chicken. <laughs> I would never again fear anyone who looked down on my race as being inferior to them. When I turned six, I went to live with my social worker mother and health inspector father, who were both former school teachers and voracious readers. Tireless community workers, they inspired us to read and regularly tested our understanding of the contents, explaining the complexities of whatever we found difficult to understand and encouraging us to compose essays, reviewing all that we had digested. Read, read, read. That's all we heard. But they also taught us a very valuable lesson because they always brought stray kids home. And they would give them our beds, and we always used to have to sleep on the floor. And they would give them some of our clothes. So one day, when I was nine years old, I was brave enough to confront my mother in the kitchen and ask her, why are you always giving away our clothes and uh, we have to sleep on the floor? And she said, you know, those children we bring here, they might be here for only a week, but when they leave here, they don't know where they are going. And in a few months, those clothes of yours that I've given to them will be raggedy because they, know, they don't know where their next clothes are coming from. But you will always have a home and you will always have clothes. Never ever forget that. And always lived by that belief and the first time I slept in my bed was when I went to boarding school when I was 12 years old. <clears throat> it was during those ensuing years that I came to comprehend the thinking of European and Asian societies, particularly their perceptions of African people. Growing up under colonialism and the ugly horrors of apartheid, which was in institutionalized in 1948 when I turned nine. I came to realize very early that the future would be filled with racial hatred, 
towards Africans, a battle I would have to fight for the rest of my life. It became an abomination whose roots grew deep inside the invasion of our continent, beginning, beginning with Arab trade as far back as the 13th century. Through the hundreds of years when Africans were enslaved, their brutal transportation to the Western world, and how casually their suffering was and is still being treated as a minor in, uh, event in the history of the human race. By the middle of the 17th century, when Jan van Riebig anchored his ship at the Cape of Good Hope, he elected to establish the first Dutch colony in South Africa. The Khoisan native people of the region initiated war against this European invasion with such determination that the government of the Netherlands established Robben Island of the coast as a prison for political mutineers. Later, the great Khosa kings of the Eastern Cape, Hinsa, Nguika, Makana. These are very strange names to many of us today. When I ask people sometimes in the Eastern Cape, do you know Hinsa or Nguika or Makana? They look at me and they say, what instrument did he play? <laughs> now, these people were likewise incarcerated on the island for leading their people against subsequent English colonial uh, administrations. The following two centuries saw battles against the Dutch and British settlers escalate as the new settlers came down from Europe by the thousands to this newly discovered paradise called South Africa. With the British armies now driving the Afrikaner Dutch immigrants northwards into the spears of the Zulu militias, massacres of thousands were suffered by all sides. Ushaka Kazenzaga Kona, the founder of the Zulu nation, never got to lead his armies against the colonial battalions, but his predecessors, I mean his successors, his brother Dingan, the kings Tetwayo, Dingiswayo, Bambata, and other generals of the Botswana, Mandebele, the Matsonga, the Bapedi, the Wavenda, Waswati, Basutu, and Krikwas led bloody crusades against the foreign military forces. When the colonies finally contained the combined efforts of all Southern African resistance at the end of the 19th century, European rule eventually prevailed. The indigenous ethnic groups were defeated by the powers of the cannons, the Gatlings, the bombs, and the collaborators. The might of the gun could not be matched by the spears and the shields of the Africans. And then with the discovery of priceless mineral wealth, a European, a European war between the Dutch and the English over the new treasures ranged from 1895 until 1910 in our country, when the whites came to form finally the Union of South Africa as a result of pressure from the British Crown on whose throne said Queen Victoria. The vanquished were put to work as servants in this endless war war, at the end of which most of their land and possessions were seized. They were forced into cheap labor on the white farms, mines, and industries of the developing European towns and rural outposts. This period then gave birth to recently organized political parties, protests, and resistance fostered by the newly formed African uh, National Congress, which was founded in 1912 by John Dube, Pixley Kaseme, Sol Plachi, and their outraged colleagues. As the organization grew over the following decades, it spawned brilliant leaders like Albert Lutuli, Lillian Ngoi, Silope Tema, A.B. Kruma, Z.K. Matthews, Aidam Tuana, Yusuf Dadu, Moses Kotane, and other brilliant minds. Its youth league spawned firebrands such as Walter Sisulu, Oliver Tambo, Duma Nokwe, and Nelson Mandela, to name a few. Mangali Sosobukwe soon broke away from them to form the Pan African Congress which demanded the continent back through the slogan of Africa for the Africans. He was hurled into Robben Island, 
very quickly, at least three years before Sisulu, Ahmed Kathrada, and Nelson Mandela were also sent there. Sobuko had first led Africans to burn their hated identity books, a campaign which was repeated by the African National Congress and became the prime catalyst for the Shavville massacre. On Robben Island, Sobukwe was isolated from all other political prisoners. He was later released into house arrest in the town of Kimberley, where he soon died very mysteriously from tuberculosis. With African leadership now imprisoned, banished, exiled, or assassinated, a yawning void in activism against apartheid grew to the extent that the silence and inertia rendered the oppressed flustered, perhaps feeling defeated, cowed, and intimidated. All these things happened when I was still very young, very, very young. Of course, we grew up in rallies, we grew up in boycotts, we grew up in marches, and we learned the songs of resistance when we were still very, very young. Thousands of them, we don't know who wrote them, but our songs are very short, maybe two or three lines, but a great dance. And as soon as you join the people, you fall into the song. It takes you maybe a second to get your part and groove with everybody else. But the resilience of our people is not an easy thing to contain. From the burnt out ashes of our quiet desperation arose a shining comet, a planet called Steve Bantu Biko, imploring Africans to pursue black consciousness as a way of life. Bantu Biko preached the gospel of self-knowledge first. He believed that the hunger for Western values and political and traditional, I mean, for political methods. He believed that to hunger for Western values and political methods was leading Africans away from their traditional values, indigenous legacies, historical glories, and cultural heritage. To seek freedom based on European democratic philosophies was to abandon the very elements that made Africans the unique people they had been prior to the arrival of the colonists and their religious missionaries who carried a Bible in one hand and a rifle in the other. Just when the arch architects of apartheid came to believe that the, Africa, that the African quest for freedom and liberty had been crushed through the imprisonment of the preachers of liberty and through the burning of all liberation organizations, here comes this inspirational young teacher fanning the dimming coals of African liberty fires. The, the disciples of Henrik Vervoort, the arch architect of apartheid, chose to act swiftly against the seeds Bantu Biko was planting. They sought to render the ground on which he was sowing barren and arid. They had to take away his life to pop the balloon of his dreams, to eclipse the deep love he cherished for his people, for his forebears, to blur the vision of our heritage, to create fear in the hearts of those who would dare to yearn for the visibility of their cultural inheritance, to fog the windows through which wide vistas of independence appeared bright and clear to cloud the roads leading to deliverance from chains and whips, neck braces of lead, and eternal, and eternal solitary confinement of our society. Bantu Biko's life was yanked from us as brutally as was that of Lumumba, of Subukwe, of Makana, of the Mtenges, of the people of Shabville, of the children of 1976, and millions of people of the continent of Africa, for whom there is nary a plaque anywhere today. But Bantu Biko's ideals, his dream refuses to fade. 
His legacy says no to the death sentence through constant torture and assault that was suffered upon his being. The time is indeed emerging again where African people will strive to revive the constant visibility of their heritage among themselves and for their children. They will create academies where we will be enabled once more to relearn our languages, where we will be taught the songs of our great, 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 great grandparents, where we will play the drums, the mbiras, the marimbas, the balophones, the ouds, the shakers, the choras, the bells, the violins, the scratchers, the clefs, the cymbals, the tumbas, the tam-tams, and the talking drums of our ancestors. Dancing to the choreography they have sculpted us for. We will build academies where our remaining aged will come to recite for us their oral pref uh, proficiencies withdrawn from the banks of their very lasting recalls of where our roots are still blooming and buried. We will build establishments where today's old and new generations will go and learn of the Songhai Empire, the Mali Empire, the Ghana Empire, Mapungubwe, Monomotapa, Mozambique, Khoisan, Ituri, Dogon, Ashanti, Maasai, Peul, Igbo, Maninka, Nama, the Nile, the Zambezi, the Kalahari, the Congo, the history of Africa according to Africa. We will build monuments for those who were massacred during the Atlantic crossings of slavery, those who were murdered for refusing to go west by force, or those who jumped overboard rather than land in New Orleans, South Carolina, Mississippi, Caribbean, Brazilian, South American, and European slave markets. We will fashion conservatories where we shall bring back Louis Armstrong, King Oliver, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, Duke, Count, Ella, Sarah, Billy, Bird, Miles, Edda Jones, Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, James Brown, Miriam Makeba, Franco, Fela, Ebenezer Obey, Zeke Sunkosi, Dorothy Masuka, Victor Lazeloan, the Manhattan Brothers, the Dark City Sisters, Lemi Mabaso, Spokes Mashian, Dolly Rateb, and Temi Piliso, the Samba, Bob Mali, Fela Kuti, Demba, Tabule, Dumisani Marayre, Chiwoniso Marayre, Lucky Dube, Kipimu Ekesi, Ellen Silinga, Alfia Sunkosi, Salif Keita, Yusindu, and all the other gods of our music. We will construct institutions where we will learn again our praise poetry, where we will reclaim our names, where the teaching of our ancient designs, couture, cuisine, artisanship, sculpture, furniture, household goods, car, arts and crafts, architecture, horticulture, agronomy, and agriculture will be as accessible as iPads, computers, cell phones, apps, iPods, television, radio, and glossy magazines, where our presence on the aforementioned screens will be more frequent than the daily news, the wigs, the extensions, the skin lighteners, and the urbanization and brainwashing of our psyches. We will be as visible as Victoria Falls, the Sahara, the Namibian dunes, the Serengeti Plains, the Big Five, and Kruger National Park. We will construct museums where our art treasures will be on view, where our stolen artifacts adorning European, Western, and Asian museums will tour the exhibition halls of our Academies of Heritage Restoration. And we will send them back and borrow them now and again because it's not worth going to war for. And why the hell they want to keep them, we'll never know. But it's okay. They can keep them if they'll borrow them to us from time to time. The world will cease to fear the return of a universal Africa, spanning the whole wild world and ushering an era where 
ushering in an era where future generations will not say when they are asked, it is rumored that we used to be Africans long ago. We will not abandon the pursuit of learning about other cultures, albeit without mimicking or imitating them, but we will have our own heritage as a mirror against them, totally consuming us to the point that we perceive our own as savage, heathen, pagan, backward, barbaric, or primitive. Yes, we will zip up our boots and go back to our roots. We will be our original selves again, where we will return to our own frontiers, which were in place long before the European invasions and the colonizations. It is then that we will cease to be manipulated into going to war over frontiers and countries that were decided through courtesy of the Kaiser of Germany in 1886. We shall let the world finally realize that who we are is not only harmless, but beautiful, educational, and very highly civilizing. That our society possesses the most diverse cross-section of cultural content in the world, and that the time for its restoration is now, and that its time has come. That is not to be feared. It is not a threat, but a major asset to the possibility the possibility of humanity being re-civilized back into an environment of peace and harmony. We shall achieve these dreams which Bantu Biko was crucified for. And when we do, Bantu Biko will be smiling where he is, singing, dancing, and living in us, with us, for Africa. Our consciousness of self will have been reinstated, and we will have discovered that we are one and do not need the trappings of what the dominating cultures wish us to be for their own benefits only. That day is nigh. It shows very clearly Bantu Biko will never die. His soul will not rest, will not rest. It will rise and rise up there alongside the greatest children of our continent's former glories. Long live the heritage and legacy of Bantu Biko. Steve Biko would want us to do this, and this we will do. Viva Bantu Biko and the invincible spirit of African excellence. Viva. Thank you. Um, uh, in keeping with the LSE tradition for public events, um, uh, he has agreed to, to respond to some questions or comments. Uh, there are stewards over there with microphones, and so if you have any questions, you. Um, I forgot to say, I hope you have some bail money for me. Absolutely, no problem. <laughs> And, and please keep your questions short and um, focused as possible. We don't have much time, so uh, you know, we, we have about half, 20 minutes of question time. So any questions or comments? I see one, somebody there, right? Thank you. One country that uh, supported uh, the apartheid and armed it was Israel. And uh, the indigenous, they are now facing increasing apartheid, which is intensifying every day with colonization. Now they call, the Palestinians called for a boycott. And artists in the UK, for example, are slowly, but too slowly, getting, uh, starting to support this boycott. And I'd like to hear from you a message that art is is part of the campaign, it's part of the struggle, 
and that they should not start, stay aside and just look on when such a horrid, horrid uh, war crime con committed against the indigenous people. Thank you. Take two more comments. There was not yes. a question. Well, it's a comment. Yeah, it's a comment. It's a comment, okay. <laughs> Can you, hear, can, you, can you repeat that with the microphone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. um, I was saying, I was just going to ask what you think the role of black consciousness is in the contemporary world and contemporary South Africa. Thank you. One more question. Well, can I answer that? No, you have three questions. Oh, I have three <laughs> one questions. More, one more question. Okay. Oh, you well, remember sure, sure. that? You? I wouldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I just wanted to get your view on um, what I'd say are two parallel narratives in South Africa at the moment. One being that now that we're into 20 years after democracy, black people apparently should have um, been able to empower themselves. And another is, um, uh, you know, that white people have no responsibility in uplifting people who had 20 years to get their act together. And there seems to be kind of a discourse between what uh, I would say maybe part of the white section believes they are not implicit in the condition of the current contemporary black South Africa, and the other view that says that we are still owed something. What's your view on that uh, contestation? Will you, okay. will you remember that? I'm not trying to do it. <laughs> one was on black consciousness. I got that one. And one was the last one I didn't, and the first, one, uh, the first one sounded like a proclamation. Yes, the statement. Yes. Yeah. It was the right? other one is about you know the, the emerging divide within South Africa between. Huh? The, 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 Yeah, I'll get back to you. Uh, the, he was asking about um, the growing differentiation, class differentiation in South Africa. Okay. okay. Let me let me start with. You spoke rather softly, but um, uh, what am I? This is very loud now. <laughs> or maybe it's me, right? Wow. Um, in the history of human beings, there's never been a time when um, a group has said, listen, we are sorry that we killed you, enslaved you, put you in prison, raped um, your grounds for all your mineral wealth, took away your land, and put you in uh, cheap labor camps and uh, made unbelievably uncountable fortunes from you. Here's 500 trillion pounds to show you how sorry we are. That has never happened in the history of human beings. And it's not about to happen anywhere, and especially not in South Africa. Because we have to remember that South Africa was built on greed. And that even though South Africa was a pariah state and couldn't do business in other parts of the world and had um, surrogates, you know, like France, who, who brought them the oils and, 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 uh, and, um, and the weapons and other countries, including this one. Um, South African businesses were only been done by yeah, people of European origin. Africans were not allowed to do business until maybe the 19, late 1970s. Um, when we became free, we freed all that community that couldn't do business in the world easily. Not only that, but they couldn't do business in Africa at all. And today, all the new businesses in Africa are those businesses. So what I'm trying to say to you is, unless we pick up our boots 
I mean, zip up our boots. Unless we do that, nobody is going to come to us and say, hey, here. And like the, the biggest aid that we can get is not like financial or foreign aid. The biggest aid that we can get is the one that we possess, our heritage. If we can get back to who we are, we can have our own industries, the things that I talked about that we, we have abandoned. In, uh, I mean, like you look at, for instance, um, the hair products today, you know, pull $100 billion a year out of the African community. So it's just one of the things. I, want, I don't want to talk about religion and other things, you know. So we, ha we, we have to, without abandoning what is good, you know, in, in foreign cultures, we have to really, like, um, find something for ourselves that we own, that we can sell, that we can deal with, so that we, once we are ourselves, I think we will get more respect than when we have our hands out and asking. Of course, it's not easy. But then we've been suffering for the last 400 years, you know. Another 100 years if that we spend to become ourselves won't hurt us that much. But I don't think we should have any expectations of um, miracles from the outside, you know. The miracles only happen in the media. You know, they tell us, oh, South Africa, what a miracle country. But inside, um, nothing is much changes except that we can vote today. We're not harassed by police if you are uh, creative enough or if you have um, the right connections. Maybe you can get one foot into like the other world. But um, uh, um, um, I mean, um, you, you can, this is not just South Africa. It's just about every country in the world. People who are underfoot never get out from under the foot, especially when they expect that um, uh, the ones who oppress them will help them. They won't. All they want to do is to look at the ledger line. And business is about profit. It's not about charity. If we get that in our heads, maybe we'll start thinking differently. I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. Thank you. Give him the mic. Let's, can you speak louder this time so we can hear you? Okay. No, the thing is, very recently, uh, friends of mine were talking about this. Uh, oh, sorry, like this. Oh, there we go. Because um, I'm South African, and I, of course, I interact with white South Africans. But uh, we're having this discussion just this past weekend. And amongst our white um, friends, I would say, you know, there was this um, sense that we are the current newer generation of the white South Africans. We are not the ones who actually took away your land. We are not the ones who set up the economic machine as it is. So we have no kind of nothing to pay you back worth. We just find ourselves in this privileged condition and we are not, uh, we shouldn't be kind of be guilt ridden all the time. So my question, I just wanted to get your feel into that sort of psyche from the, from the white contemporary, uh, shall we say, the one who did not really, was not the original taker but is, is making part of the newer South Africa. Are you talking about white youth? Pr predominantly, and perhaps yeah. the liberal, progressive, Well, I mean, typical um, white. Um, it's, it's a very comfortable or a convenient thing to say. You know, it doesn't take away uh, the wrong. And first of all, um, 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 they don't have the bread. They're not the ones who have the money. They're not holding the money. And they probably, many of them say that to make sure that their parents give them pocket money. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's an easier thing to say than to say, I'm going to try and be part of righting the wrongs. That, have, that, I mean, I think that it's incumbent upon everybody in the world, not just certain people. It's incumbent upon everybody in the world to oppose injustice, regardless of whether they were there or not. So for me, uh, that kind of answer is a load of rubbish. Thank you. Can we take another round of three questions? Well, he, he, oh, 
You asked about what is the role of black consciousness in, in today's contemporary world, right? Um, I, I don't think that when Steve Biko talked about black consciousness, he was talking, he was thinking about the contemporary world. I don't think that to get to know ourselves, we should like consider the contemporary world because the virus is in our society and we have to heal our society first, you know? And when you say the contemporary world, that also is a media word that was created not by us, you know? We don't live in the contemporary world. We live in the world of Africa, the world of uh, uh, um, slums, the world of uh, uh, squalor, world of cheap labor, of being exploited, of, you know, of uh, our continent uh, is wealth not built. We don't own the continent of Africa, you know? And, and uh, we have international uh, business surrogates running certain countries. We fight over borders that we didn't, uh, um, uh, um, that we had nothing to do with. That is what Steve Biko was talking about. He said, stop thinking uh, as part of the contemporary world because you are not. And that doesn't make us racist. Because if you're a victim, you can't be a racist. You have to, you're a patient, you have to recover first, you know. And um, Africa doesn't only need psychiatric recovery, you know. We also badly need economic recovery, and we have to figure it out for ourselves. But we're not going to find out what it is or what it is about until we discover ourselves. When we discover ourselves and we find out that Africans are not just only in Africa, but that we're probably more than the Chinese internationally. I think that is one of the things that's most feared about Africans is that if they got together, they'd be, they'd be, I mean, it would just, it's, you know, I mean, people on Wall Street and Free Street, I think, have nightmares when they think about that thought. It's a very scary thought in the contemporary world. <laughs> Yeah, three more questions. Uh, please, brief and start at the, way the back there. Uh, thank you. I would like first to appreciate and honor uh, Professor Kandawire. For the last time I was at LSE, I always question the kind of speakers that they are invited. And I can assure you, you that you need, we need to collect money for your bail when you live here. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your frankness. And like we are saying, we are not apologetical to be black. And we should always propagate the blackness and what the Western has done to us. And we, we are not, I always say to the LSE professors holding such uh, you know, lectures of saying, don't bring people who will come and rubbish Africa. <laughs> come, bring people who will be come and tell you about Africa. Not people who will come and say, you know, corruption and Zuma and ANC and that. We are sick and tired of that. The media has fed us enough. We are enough. We want people like you much sicker. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, first, thanks for that. It was amazing to hear you uh, speak and, and your poem. And, uh, and, and music, and I wanted to ask about uh, music, really, um, uh, music and activism. Uh, you've dedicated your life to playing amazing music and, and dedicate, dedicating it to the cause of, of uh, human liberation. And I think that in the era of apartheid and um, the, de uh, the era of colonization, the kind of, uh, the enemy was clear and the struggle was clear. And it was like break down uh, apartheid, break down the, the, all the civil rights marches and, and, and movements. And there was a real kind of sense of unity among artists like yourself, Miriam Makiba, uh, Bob Marley, James Brown. Everyone was sort of a, talking about the same kinds of things of black liberation, of human liberation. And there were very obvious things to fight against. But in, in 2014, the world power is much more uh, hidden, sort of fractured, it's in hiding in plain sight, but it's much more sort of fractured, and the enemy isn't quite so obvious, and even the kind of who the people are that we're all trying to rally together with music isn't quite so obvious, because we're all much more 
uh, diverse and diluted and not, there's no clear places to stand like this is the good side and this is the bad side. It's all much more complicated. So I wanted to ask what your thoughts were regarding the power of music and the role of music in continuing the sort of liberation struggle to fight against injustice in terms of bringing people together in a much more complicated and fractured world. There's one more question. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back. I'll go back. Hi, um, thank you very much for your talk. You, having just come back um, from South Africa, uh, I'm disappointed to say that I've <clears throat> returned from a country that I think was a lot more fracturous than I expected it to be, and disappointingly so, where um, wounds were expected to be healed, I saw more septic wounds um, fomenting. So my question to you is, do you really believe that there is a hope for the great recovery and union of South Africa? I didn't get the last part of my question. What, ho oh, sorry. what hope does you hold for South Africa? Yeah. You want to take a look? Should I answer that one first? Well, you can, uh, there's one more, I think. Okay. Take one more. At the end, at the back. Of the, what, what? You for your lecture. Put it to your mouth, dear. Think like a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your words and your music. Uh, you said that um, uh, steam Ella al always brings joy and uh, laughter, but I was crying all the time while, while you were uh, performing it. So, and I'm not particular, uh, particularly an emotional person, so it's just to say that it always brings tears. I also wanted to say that I studied here at LSE. I did my master's here on the economic history of, so of Southern Africa, and that um, <coughs> Steve Mella always brings all that history of Southern Africa. The, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm very nervous, but anyway. Um, my question is, you say that we are not on the contemporary world in response to a question uh, prior to, to mine. Uh, what I wanted to know is what do you think about South Africa being part of uh, the, BRIC, the BRICS uh, uh, block of countries? Is that being part of the contemporary world? That's my question. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, OK. So I can only so think of music. Uh, okay. South I'll, start from, about South Africa. I'll start from the back. About BRICS, I didn't know it uh, um, described countries. I thought it was for building until, <laughs> until somebody broke it down for me, that it was missing a K. Um, I, fi I, I find it difficult to think about Africa from only a South African perspective, you know. I can only think about Africa from a, a perspective of Africans all over the world because the African world all over the world has had the same raw deal, you know. And, um, and I'm more concerned, like Steve Biko was, with Africans realizing that they're Africans and that they're one and that if they got together and became conscious of who they are, they might break out of this yoke, you know, that began in slavery. I don't think about South Africa um, 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 in, in, in economic terms the way the world talks about economic, because when, when we talk about South Africa or Africa and we talk about economy, whose economy are we talking about if we don't own the continent, if we don't own the wealth of the continent? Surely when they talk about the, the, the economy of like the stock exchanges and all that, it's not our economy. It's, I mean like the majority of people, of African peoples all over the world, all over the world, anywhere that you go, live in poverty and in squalor and uh, uh, they can't seem to get out of, out of it. Now, 
The saddest part is the, the Africans who were taken overseas and have been convinced that they have nothing to do with Africa. Our fight is much, much, it's, it's almost, it's, 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 it's more about like heritage restoration and cultural revival in our heads because once we can get our old traditional values, once we can hook up with that, maybe we can start talking about being members of the world economy. But right now we are the servants of the world. You know, some of us are educated, some of us have gone to LSE, but the villages we come from are in poverty, you know. And um, that's a fact that we have to, to, to face. Uh, we grew up uh, when, we, when we're told that education will make you better, but you can't be better alone, you know. If you go out then you... If you better alone and, 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 and um, you become a billionaire and you forget where you come from, you join um, the other world, you know, and you leave uh, your people behind. The one thing I learned from Miriam Makeva and Bob Dylan and Bob Marley, you know, and Harry Belafonte and Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie is that if you come from a people through whom you have reached where you are, you know, and um, you are using those people as a resource for your uh, uh, platform to go up. And when you make it, you forget about them. The gods are going to turn against you, you know. There is no way that you can be successful through the people you come from and not talk about them. And that is not activism. It's just like paying back the debt, you know. And I think that that, that's a, that is a, a, a thought pattern that is very difficult to get into people because everybody is chasing the buck. But once you got it, what you got? Only the buck. But the buck won't free you and the buck won't bring you happiness. Shakespeare. <laughs> The role of music, uh, you know, to a very great extent, music became popular because it was attached to causes. You know, like South African music became popular to a great extent because of apartheid, because of Miriam Makeba, first of all, you know. And when she came overseas, people were saying, wow, you know, I remember Bella, Bella Fonte telling me, he said, you know, when she came, she was singing all these beautiful songs and they sounded like songs about flowers and love and the rainbow. And then when she told me what the songs are about, I started crying. I didn't realize it was such sad subjects. But um, what held, for instance, uh, um, and, and helped the struggle against the uh, apartheid was the fact that the whole world was unified and cemented by uh, their objection to apartheid. And once apartheid was gone, because apartheid is gone, you know, apartheid is gone. Our problem is economy right now. But apartheid held us together, and when, 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 the, when the fight is over, everybody tries to go back to, like, make their lives, you know. And the ones who were solidarity groups go back, they go, you're free now, bye, you know. And, um, and that's it. And so, like, that kind of song, that kind of uh, support goes away. People expect you to make it on your own after that. And uh, the new administrations that take over are the ones that have the, the new power. And if they don't come through, um, it's difficult to sing the same song again. You know, uh, and, 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 and many, many societies are tired because they have sung the songs of freedom and they elected new governments. And uh, they find that um, um, they, they, they are still in the same position, you know. I mean, you look at what happened in the Middle East. It was so glamorous when everybody was fighting for freedom. It was just a beautiful thing to behold on television. And then we've seen it crumble. Because the one thing also that's a, a, a become a setback about liberation movements is that now they've become a business, you know. The arms dealers of the world probably cause a, a, a revolutionary <laughs> movement so that they can sell arms. <laughs>
You know, I mean, even South Africa, we're a free country, and uh, um, we, we um, object to injustice, but we're also an arms-dealing country, you know. So, I mean, uh, the, the contradictions uh, are just right. And like, I think that the musicians are, are tired of singing about these things because they sing and they sing. And um, I mean, Harry Belafonte, uh, you know, uh, helped me to come to school in, in, in the States with Miriam McEver. And sometimes he looks at me and says, you know, Hugh, we worked so hard. And Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all these people, Medgar Evers, they died, we marched, we dug bullets. And we made it possible for today's uh, uh, um, generations to live the life that they live, you know, and the freedoms they have. But they don't say nothing. They say they were not there, you know. They say they were not there. But the one thing that I know personally is that if you don't, if you are not vigilant about the freedom that you have won, it's not going to last. They're going to take it away from you. Just two. Yeah, uh, two questions. One there, and then one there. Now. No, oh, no, I'm sorry. I've been, I've been, no, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I've been unfair to this group. So one did there, and then didn't somebody else. Didn't you ask a question? He oh, did. no, it was yeah, a lady no, no. behind you. Yeah, but let, uh, just be fair. Be one, next one will be that side. But let me start for one, one question aside. Good evening. What are the two most important lessons you have learned that you would like to impart with us this evening? What you want to ask them? There's one more question outside. And, yeah, yes, please. Um, can I just preface it, my question, firstly by saying it's great to be in, in the presence of greatness. He bring the mic nearer to your mouth. <laughs> nearer to me, sorry. Um, no, I was just saying that um, when you started, you were self-deprecating by saying you're not a, 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 an icon or a legend, but in fact, you're more than that to many of us. It's actually great to be, you know, it's actually good to be in, in, in your presence, even though I've been to so many concerts. But I have two very short questions, related questions, really. One touches on the, um, the question before the very last one, which is um, arts and activism and the fact that too many contemporary uh, artists, be they musicians or sculptors or painters from our continent, from Africa, tend to compromise perhaps a little more than usual now. And I'm, and I'm thinking perhaps this is really down to the uh, influx of the American culture. I wonder how, if you, if you care to comment on this. When Marianne first started, for example, she would not sing in English, if I remember rightly. Who? Marianne Makeba. She, she, she would mostly speak in, in the native language. No, uh, she, no, she sang in English, but she didn't. She didn't sing about diamonds and right. And so, uh, so you know, the American culture now <laughs> has invaded most of our uh, arts in a broader sense in Africa. I wonder what, what your observation is on that. And finally, um, very briefly, yeah, very briefly. Now, um, in the newspaper last week, it was reported that the Mandela family are effectively imploding. Um, um, Winnie has gone to the High Court asking for the will to be blocked because she was effectively excluded from it. I'm just wondering whether you, what your observation is on the Mandela legacy and how that is actually influencing. Okay. Okay, so I'll start with uh, uh, you, sir. Um, what the first thing is that uh, uh, that is very important is that I don't like to go into other people's private business. I don't I don't put my business in the streets, and uh, what the Mandela family is doing is not my business. I can't comment on things that I don't know shit about, and I don't, you know. 
I'm here with you in London, I'm mostly in... Uh, I mean, if somebody came and asked me about your finances, even though I don't know you, I would say, shit, no, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> And the second thing is that um, the music industry internationally, not just uh, in Africa, just internationally, has changed. Um, uh, first of all, uh, in, the, in, in the 80s, after Michael Jackson sold uh, 60 million records, he hadn't planned to, but when he sold 60 million records, the original owners of the music industry in, internationally were bought out by groups of uh, rich lawyers and accountants. And it became about how many units you can sell. And then with the introduction of uh, the new technology, um, not only did it kill the music industry, the recording industry as we know it, but it's about units, selling units. And you can do it in your bathroom with a little machine. Some people make records on their phones, you know, and you don't have to be talented, you can just sample your voice and make it sound good, and uh, otherwise we wouldn't have uh, uh, we wouldn't have gotten head uh, like Gangnam Style, Gangnam Style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, and uh, with everybody uh, who is going into the business, you know, today popular music, it's about uh, they just, you want to make money and get those golden chains and the diamonds and drink. Um, 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 uh, crystal champagne and go out with babes and, 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 and talk shit, you know, but um, it has nothing to do with art anymore. I think that um, um, art is, a, is, is, is as old as, uh, I mean, like that, that part, you, it'll never come back again. That part of the music industry is as gone as uh, a 1963 Chevy Impala. You won't see it again. Gone with the wind. <laughs> Sorry, <you. laughs> well, the about, ask about What lesson have you? Ask about what lesson is you, have you got from your experience? What, if you were to transmit. Oh, if I had to, um, you said what two things? I would tell people not to do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think the first thing I would, um, advice I would give to anybody, except, especially, you know, my uh, children or grandchildren or, or, or nephews or nieces is don't go into politics. <laughs> don't go into politics because it's dangerous. You know, it's just dangerous and you're not going to be there for a long time. You know, it's built so that, like, if you're lucky, there's two terms, unless you become a dictator. And when you become a dictator, then your life is in danger. There's, it's not a win-win a situation. It's, it's a pray-pray, uh, take-take, and uh, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I would warn you in case you have uh, that kind of ambition, keep, keep to your photography. And, um, and the second one um, uh, um, is um, sex is overrated, so don't try and overdo it. <laughs> well, uh, look, uh, all good things must come to an end. And, um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, uh, there are a lot of questions one would have wanted to ask you. I mean, I, and, and, um, and time is against that. There are some very strict rules here about time and fire, and, I don't know, and so we have to end now. But before, before I do that, there are two things that we have to, uh, before I just start up, I, I, I ask, ask you, the audience, to join me in thanking you for not only his, his wisdom, but also for his generosity to have played for us. 
uh, this is just a, an amazing experience with the LSE. Uh, mm. Well, I've got everybody's address and I'm sending bills. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so I really enjoyed the, the, the discussion. You. There are two quick orders of uh, two quick orders of business here. F uh, first, I would like to call upon Kosina uh, Dibiko, who is Steve's eldest child and the CEO of the Steve Biko Foundation, to make a special presentation to to you. I was given the simple task of uh, giving Barahu a small token of appreciation, um, but I'm an African, and they say you don't ever ask an African to say a few words because there is no such. Uh, <laughs> I haven't even been asked to say a few words, but I will say a few. <laughs> Two things, and this is really stories about Brahu. Uh, my favorite stories, I was reminding him about uh, these he said earlier he would either be brewing beer or dealing in sushi. I think that he, he would have made it as a, as a comedian. Uh, <laughs> the first is about life in exile. And it's a funny story at the you know, surface until you get to, to, to the texture of it. Uh, he says on one occasion uh, that as an activist in exile, uh, he knew he was getting into trouble when one day he woke up uh, in the middle of a dream. And he was bothered by this dream because for the first time, and this is, had been a couple of years of uh, Hugh being in exi exile in the US, he found that he was starting to dream in English. <laughs> <laughs> and so he says you would then <laughs> go to uh, Central Park and uh, start practicing his Zulu and speaking uh, with the pigeons there, just, <laughs> <laughs> just to keep it real. <laughs> the second one is, I don't know if you are familiar with a system called lay-by over here, but it's very big in many parts of the continent where when you are procuring something, you would go and put you know, an installment and then another uh, he had uh, a friend who was a very well-dressed uh, fellow and who would undermine him occasionally for the stuff he was wearing. So he made up his mind he was going to go and buy this pair of shoes, a special pair of shoes. And he would go and put 20 shillings and another and yet another. And he saved enough on this one occasion and got to the store to discover that there was only a small portion left. Uh, so he put that down payment and retrieved his shoes and he says Melite, which means my young brother, I took the change and I went to throw a party for releasing my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we remember in South Africa and honor Brahu for being one of the primary examples of how to take our gifts and put it behind a cause. And he was an ambassador of our cause in many parts of the world, and this is why this hall is filled today to embrace him and to hear his thought. I'd like to thank him on behalf of the Steve Biko Foundation and LSE, uh, as well as our partners, the British Council. I'd like to thank him really on behalf of uh, all of uh, uh, you for being here, given that I was given that task. Uh, and uh, I know he will be performing again on Monday. He's been on the road for about three months, I said to him, I'll go home and rescue his citizenship. He's at the risk of losing it for being away from home for so, so long. Thank you, Bahu, for your thoughts tonight. Thank you very much. This is a 
a certificate uh, as well as a portrait of the <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, one, oh, one, one more item on, oh, on that. Um, I'd like to call upon Mr. Graham Sheffield of the British Council, who uh, the, the, the British Council has been one of the supporters of this event tonight, and you may want to say, say something about it. Good evening, everybody. I'm sorry to detain you from what I'm sure will be a, a very welcome um, drink. Uh, I certainly wouldn't mind one. Um, thank you, uh, Hugh, for such an amazing uh, uh, performance, actually, I think I can describe it as. I think um, you've told a most powerful story, not only of yourself, but also of your country. So I think, having thought of you primarily as a musician, I think you make a pretty mean historian as well. Um, and you've told the story not only through words, which were musical and poetic in themselves, but also um, through music, sound, and performance. And not many historians can do that. So uh, I think you've done a pretty amazing job. And I'd just like to say, you know, you said you started off by saying you haven't failed. You failed because people are still fighting. Um, I don't think you've failed. We just haven't got to the end of the song. And you need to write a few new verses for that song. Um, uh, so I I'm delighted we've been able to support this event uh, with the Department of Arts and Culture in South Africa. Um, thank you to the Steve Biko Foundation and also to the LSE. Um, the Steve Biko Foundation's objectives, supporting development, identity and culture and society, are very much shared by us at the British Council. And as an organisation, we recognise and seek to support those links between arts and activism and their power to strengthen self-expression and democratic values. Um, in March this year, we launched a two-year season to celebrate 20 years of democracy in South Africa with the Department of Arts and Culture. And this new collaboration is already um, seeing the young people of the two countries, our two countries, engage in a program to strengthen further our cultural relations between us in photography, design, fashion, film, theater, literature, music, digital media. These, in a sense, are those new songs that we have to create, the new narratives, which will give us all hope in the next 20 or so years. We're really aiming to promote contact between peoples with programs that will have young people, particularly between 18 and 35, as it were, the next generation of power, uh, in connecting new generations of creative professionals, fostering skills in the creative industries, sharing expertise and encouraging innovation in developing the creative careers of young people. This is our joint mission. It also presents an opportunity to showcase and promote uh, British art in South Africa and South African arts here, um, challenging and updating perceptions that are often outdated and stereotypical and not true to, to the peoples of our two nations. Um, and we're also obviously trying to build a renewed trust between the UK and South Africa. We also already encompass the British Council's Connect ZA programme, which has created many opportunities for the UK sector in South Africa. And this summer, the South Af there was a big South African season in the UK, run by the Department of Arts and Culture in South Africa, um, in mostly in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and I was privileged to see quite a lot of that. I'm really here not only to pay my personal thanks to, to Hugh, who I last saw in New Zealand, actually, after we both had very long flights to the Auckland Festival last year, but I'm really here to, uh, to, to tell you about a new fund we've launched jointly with our South African friends to an open call for projects calling for new partners in both countries to get together, get involved, and apply for a number of grants to boost existing relationships and create new projects and connections for the next stage of this initiative. So I, I, I sound a bit like a commercial break, but there's money involved and you can apply for some of it. So I very much hope that those of you who might be interested in this opportunity, well, I think we've just launched it this week, haven't we, Tom? This week. Um, interested in this opportunity, seek out further information from our wonderful team, Tom and Sarah, who are running this project in the UK and South Africa, uh, sitting here at the front, 
Um, and it's all on the website, I'm sure, isn't it, Tom? Yes, thank you. And I also hope that those of you here will join us in actually witnessing and enjoying some of these projects that will develop over the next two years. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for a remarkable evening, and good luck with the rest of your tour, Hugh. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to say something, a very personal problem I have with you, that in uh, 1983, when I lived in Harare, uh, he, was, he came there to set up, uh, he wanted to set up a studio in Harare, and things didn't work out, and, but, and he was looking for accommodation, so I was leaving Harare, so I, I, I arranged with the landlord, that he takes over my, my apartment, my, the house I was in, and he gave me some money, 600 Zim dollars then, to pay in advance, but he never came back to Zimbabwe. So I still owe him the money. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I discussed with him. I, I sort of sat down and calculated in how it would be in dollars and all that. And he says he wants to be paid Jeez. only in Zim dollars. <laughs> I don't know how to be funny. Yeah. But, but anyway, uh, just to end this wonderful evening, uh, once again, uh, I'd like to express my, my, my personal gratitude. I think, also the, I think the gratitude of the school that you came here. And, and that you've been so generous with us for your time and shared so much of what was behind your music ultimately, the sense of Africa, the sense of, of, of the destiny of the continent. And so on that note, I would like to, to declare this event closed and hope to see you again here at the LSE. Mm -hmm. <laughs>